let's take a look at how easy it is to get started with WinChart. So in the Net Advantage toolbox, we can locate and double click on the Ultra Chart control. That's what we call WinChart. So if we double click on it and get an instance of this on the form. So once it's all loaded up, one of the things that happens by default is if this is the first time you're running it, we pop up a dialog that allows you to design the chart and set things up. But what I'd like to do though is skip this one and if you want to turn this off, click on preferences and remove the check that says show the chart wizard when a control instance is drawn on the form. So click OK. And we're going to just close this one out because I'd rather show it to you directly from scratch. So when you click on the chart and let's take a close look at its properties, the first thing that you might want to set is the chart type property. And I recommend setting this first because various other related properties on the chart are shown and hidden based on the chart type property. So right now it's column chart. So the chart dot column chart property is visible. So you expand that and set the various properties that relate to the column chart. However, if I set this to a pie chart, now notice that the chart dot pie chart property shows up and the other one went away. Right here. So keep that in mind if you're looking at properties and you think, hey, that label or that that property vanished. Where did it go? It's probably because you changed the chart type. So let's say if I were to go back to the chart type because we work with our chart, that's fine. And let's say if we set it back to column chart rather, and let's just throw some sample data at it. So you could set the data source at design time or at runtime if you like from wherever it is that you get your data. But if you want to build a sample or do like a little proof of concept, I want to show you where Infragistics snuck in some sample data that makes it very convenient to test your application if you don't want to grab live data. But if you can get your real data, then that's fine too. So I just want to set the data.data source property to whatever it is that you have, your collection of objects, your list of objects, your I list of objects, your I binding list of objects, or whatever it is. So the chart.data.demo table, and then you can grab any one of these methods that returns data. So let's take all positive data, and let's check this out now. So what I'm going to do is run it real quick and show you what happens. And now we get our chart. So we set that up and as you hover your mouse over you get a little bit of interaction here. Tool tips, color highlighting, and then we just basically get the labels that represent the schema of what it is that I'm bound to. So take a little deeper look now at how this works. So if I click on the chart, let's, let's um, and take a little walk through the properties. So we can set annotations in here. Let's start from the top bottom. These are all very valuable property settings and, and functionalities that are available with the chart. So annotations is basically a collection of graphical objects that can be added to the chart. So let's add callout annotation. So callout, and there's different types. If you look at this, there's lines that point out values. There's an ellipse, which is kind of like a circle. Callout is like a cartoon bubble. And box annotation is pretty much a square. And then a line image annotation. There's, there's all different types, but let's just take a look at the callout annotation. Because once you learn how this one works, then you'll know how the other ones work. It's just a different, not a different um, rendering of what it is. So text can be set to value, and then we have some text style here where if I clip it if it's not big enough, and look at where it shows up already shows up in the chart immediately. And location. location type is a very important property of how you want this annotation to behave and where it's going to show up. Column basically 
going to show up at row 0 and column 0, or row 1, column 0, which is the next batch over. See that? This is one row, this is another row, and another row, and this is the 0th column of the actual data. So you can set it up that way, where it's just hard-coded to, no matter what data you have, the first or second row, or whatever row it is, or you can go to data values. So you set your annotation to show up based on data values. You're going to give it an x and y value. So let's say if it's 20, do we have a value in there for 20? basically have to have these values somewhere in your chart. So see how see, there's basically no, you know, there's no uh, x value directly, really, like numeric, because this is just basically series labels only. But see right here, on the x, on the y axis, we have values, so let's do like 50. It's going to show up a little higher. So see, you could do it that way. So I set it to like 90, and I could say something text is something so I could do something like that and again you can set up to show you know if there's values on the x-axis as well it'll follow along that so that's one way you could add annotations if I run it, you know, the values will generate dynamically when I run it again. So it'll just jump to wherever. So see, now it's a little higher. But again, that's kind of how you get annotations to work in the chart. So now you know how that works. And then the axis property. Now this one has a lot of stuff that you can configure. The axes, so all of the axes are here. So this is the x-axis is the x2 axis. So you can even show second axis here. True, and now we have the x2 axis showing. So that's how you show or hide various axes. So let's just set it back to false so we get a little bit more state. So the extends property. Now I'm going to walk you through some properties that once you learn them here, you'll understand what they do throughout this entire API, no matter what object it is of the chart. So extends means how much how much space does it take up? So let's say right now the x well actually let's go to x1. The x1 takes up 80 for the extent. Let's let's do 40. What does that do? So see how now it basically we're leaving less room, 40 units allowed to you know allow the x-axis to occupy. So take up more space, let's do 100. Now, it uses 100 units real estate to draw itself. That's kind of what that means. So, how much space do you want the object to use to draw itself? And now here are all the labels. So, there's a item format string. So, there's a lot that we can do with item format strings. You can basically choose from a list of, from a list of formats. If I go here, let's go to this one here. So if I click Format, you get a choice of you basically choose from some of these items that are already predefined for you, like Series Label, and it pretty much, whenever you choose one of these enumeration values, it fills the format string for you. So in other words, if we were to totally remove this format property, you'd have to know the string to type in here. but Logistics added this there for you for your convenience of so series label. And if you do custom, you custom, you have to type in a value such as my own, my own value, whatever that is. But in order for in order for you to do custom series labels, you have to implement what's called I render label. What you do is you create a class that implements that, and then you write some code, and then you return whatever string you want based on program logic that you can used to analyze values as they're passed into you through that class. And that is what you assign, but I'll cover that in another video called 
custom labels and custom format strings. So then you could do things like you could flip them, set fonts, font colors, orientation right here. So if you do custom, if you do custom orientation, then you have to set an orientation angle. So it's like various things that we could do, like edit alignment and do orientation angle, let's say 45. And press enter. Notice how now it's 45 degrees. So that's how you set these properties here. True. And these are all configurable for each label. There can be many different labels for each chart type. So see, this one has, you know, series labels. Then here are the plain labels for each individual row, of, uh, each, each column of each row. So I can do it all over again. So here's the orientation angle. We have some hard-coded values that are enumerations, or if you do custom, then we can do like a five-degree angle here. And again, you just have to set it all up to whatever it is that you know that makes best sense. And now, notice that in this label, because we're talking about a column chart, this particular elements, we have more choices. We can use the data value, the item label, the label ends data. So here's an example of what that is. Because Infragistics has designed a bunch of predefined item format strings for you to use. But again, you can always use your custom ones as well. It's 150, so it takes up more space. So that's basically the X. And then the same thing goes for the Y. So here. Range min and max. Let's say if I do the range min is like 10. And let's say the max is... There, one point, let's do 100. Set up that way. So you basically kind of filter your data. You can show strip lines. Set the true. It's hard to see, but you can do um, strip lines. Basically, they're painted in between each item, or like so that way you can see. We have different values between them. Solid fill. So uh, here's another important property. Whenever you see the, the letters PE, that stands for paint elements. Paint elements, no matter where you are within the chart, or within our gauge control for that matter, that you can do many different things. You can set it up to be a solid color, an image, a hatch, a gradient, custom brush or texture. So, so for example, right now it's set to solid fill. You're going to have properties related to setting the fill color and other properties. And let's say if I do, let's say fill is maroon you know, or any other color, it, the entire element that gets drawn is gets this paint element applied to it. Go to something else, like let's say an image, then you basically have to Give it an image, so fill image, and then what you do is you navigate to an image that you may have as a resource or somewhere else, and then the image gets painted on there, and then set transparencies on there, or and image fit style where you want to stretch it or center it. So there's a lot of different things you can do with the paint element, and once you learn this here, it applies for all PEs. So one of the things I wanted to show you with the actual chart type property, there are different chart types that you can choose. So if I click on the chart type and click on the editor here, so you notice all the different chart types that we have. We have quite a few. We have like 3D, 2D charts, quite a bit. So we have pie chart, pie chart 3D. So if I click on this here, and if I run it, the data may not make sense for this, but let's just run it anyway. But just to show you some of the interactions that we could have, if I hold the Alt button down and I click and hold the mouse button down, the left mouse button, I can drag and spin this guy around. And it's really nice to interact with. So we have highlighting as you move over each item. So there's many different things that we could do. So other properties I want to show you. So 
if you go to the chart.data property and expand it, you're going to notice that there's different types of things that you can set up. So zero lines, for example, is one of the ones that I always set, but this makes sense with the bar chart ones, but line chart and bar chart types, because what that means is that it's going to start at value zero. By default, the chart will start its scale at the lowest value of your data source. But if you set that to zero lines, set zero lines to true, it'll start from zero and from that point up. So that's that's how that one would work. So again, if I go to you know, set this back to the home chart here, value will start at zero. So these are some of the properties of the chart. So there's many other things you could do, like you could turn on legends, for example, legends, you know, turn it on if you want to show it. This is true. As I do scrolling these margins, set that as well. You know, this title bottom, title left. So let's say if I just show all these guys here. So visible that's already there. I could set the um text. shows up there, let's say if I, just to show you where these other guys show up, so titles left, you can just add the text to it. And visible is set to true, and titles right, so there's many different places where you can set these titles, so here, there, up and down, the tips, you can also supply Format string for the tooltips here. So whenever you hover over a data item. And the other thing I wanted to show you was crosshairs. That one's really cool. Okay, so let's check out crosshairs, which is another cool feature I wanted to show you real quick. Look for the pineal crosshair property, set it to true, and run it and watch what happens. So now we have crosshairs, so that way you could analyze all the values that intersect the line. So I want to know what this guy is here. It's like a 35. But then I could look at the line vertically and horizontally, and I could see the other intersecting values. This is very useful in that application. So now you know some basics on how to get started with WinChart. Make sure that you take advantage of this control. And I think any application could always use a chart, no matter what it is, and just you know, throw a chart on there and provide some data visualization for your end users, so that way they're not just looking at numbers and you know values in a grid, which there's a lot of it, it could be overwhelming. So make sure you take advantage of the data visualization that comes with Windows Forms. Infragistics on the web at infragistics.com.